We're in uh, 2 Thessalonians tonight. Saw in the bulletin, probably, we're asking the question, are we in the end of the age? <laughs> Hopefully, a little more light, or this is all over. I'm not going to read these verses because we're going to be looking at them uh, one by one. Uh, we're in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to start with verse 1 and read on through verse 8, asking and hopefully answering this question, are we in the end of the age? This is Paul's second letter to the church up north in Greece in Thessaloniki, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. I'll just read the first uh, verse here, which is important, of course. Now, um, this is the King James. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together, Unto him. You may remember, uh, I know I do, a big uh, selling book came out many decades ago now that the Lord was going to return in 1988. And boy, the books were flying off the shelf. All the proof was in there. And then, it, of course, it didn't happen. And the author put out another version and another edition, and he said he'd made a couple of miscalculations. And the next year, the book was titled 88, 89 Reasons Why the Lord is Going to Return in 1989. Well, it didn't happen that time either. But as far as I know, he still, uh, still sold the books. So what are we saying? At the get-go here, uh, we're basically reminding ourselves that we want to know what the Scripture actually says, not what we think it says or what we want it to say. For example... I was uh, born again as a young fellow, about 18, and for the first, I'd say, five, six years, probably, or pretty close, um, I was taught and believed one way about the end of the age and the end times and the coming of the Lord. And I believed it so strongly that when I ran across Christians who didn't look at it the same way I did, I almost wondered if they were saved. And I thought, what do you mean you don't believe this, this, and this? And uh, the problem was I hadn't really studied it myself. I had simply believed what I'd been told by my pastor and by some books that were very popular that I had read, but I'd never studied it myself. And then when I went to graduate school and uh, was able to study some of the, the language of the New Testament and looked at it again and researched it a little bit more for myself, I found out uh, that it was nothing like what I had been told. It was something quite different. And in my opinion, it was something quite simple compared to what I had been taught. Uh, previously, when I would come across different verses about the end of the age and the end times and the return of Christ. And I would think about what I was taught and I would think about what I'm looking at and reading. And it was as though I was trying to put a round peg in a square hole. And it just never really fit until I let the Bible speak for itself and I found out that when you do that, you don't have to force anything anywhere. It kind of all comes together, and it's a blessing. So that's kind of my background in this whole subject of the second coming and the end of the age. Just make a little commercial here. If you'd like this in more detail, please just go to our website, if you're watching or listening, and uh, go to the book section and just download Ready for the Rapture. Don't let that... Don't let that title give you the impression, well, I already know that, because it's not probably what you think it means. So you're welcome to do that. It's a free download, and I think you'll enjoy the book. I hope so anyway. So let's just dig in here. What we have is an urgent appeal by the Apostle Paul. You may remember he wrote two letters to this church. He was personally invested in these uh, believers, again, up in the north of Greece. I think when he he looked at the, uh, the church, you know, by faith that he had basically birthed. Um, he was concerned that they would come up with the right teaching, that they wouldn't fall prey to false doctrine, wouldn't be taken advantage of by false believers and false teachers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he had fond memories of them. And then in addition, if you read the book of Acts, for example, ch uh, chapter 16 in particular, he probably had some sad memories about being persecuted. You may remember he wound up in jail with his friends 
uh, not for something wrong, but for something good, preaching the gospel. You may have figured out by now that not everybody is into it. We think it's the best thing since sliced bread, but a lot of people don't, don't look at it that way. So he was concerned now that this church would not be taken advantage of, and apparently it was already happening. Please just leave your Bible open in front of you. I want you to see these things with your own eyes. Um, you watching, I don't know what version you have, but I'll be giving you my paraphrase of these. But this is very, in my opinion, uh, I think you'll agree, very, very important information. This is about the end of the age. For example, a lot of people don't even believe the age is going to end. You probably know people, I know I do, that believe in something called reincarnation. And it's, you, you, you live this life, you leave this life, you come back and live it again, live it again in a perfect world. Each time you, you come through, you're a little better off than the last time. But it's circular. That's not biblical teaching. The Bible teaches a linear view of history. In other words, we're going somewhere. That's why we're thinking about the end of the age. So here it is now. Now we are urging you, brethren, Paul says, through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Right here from the get-go, I can tell you the language, the grammar that Paul uses here, if you look in your version, whichever one you're looking at, most of them read the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's an additional truth there. The word often translated and can also be translated even depending on the rest of the sentence. And because of the way Paul wrote this, you could, it's best translated even. So we say it again. Now we are urging you, brethren, through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ even our gathering together unto him. So both of these events are happening at one and the same time. The word coming is parousia, which means a coming and a subsequent presence with. So it's talking about the Lord coming and remaining with us. The second word, our gathering together to him, is very interesting it's actually a form of the word synagogue. I think just last week we talked about that, didn't we? How that the Jewish people referred to their meeting place with a Greek word, synagogi, that's Greek. They referred, as I said last time, I think it was, to their ruling party as the Sanhedrion, which is also Greek, the Sanhedrin. So this shows, I think, abundantly clearly that they were very, uh, they were very used to speaking the Greek language in addition to their vernacular Aramaic. And this word gathering together, which is what synagogue means, a gathering of the people, you know, in that case to worship, this is a gathering of us to meet the Lord as he returns, right? And it's got a little prefix on it, epi, which strengthens it. So it's a strengthened form of the synagogue meeting. It, only we're not going to be meeting him down here. We're going to be meeting him as he returns from heaven. Did you know a lot of people don't know that Jesus is in heaven? <laughs> It's quite amazing. Uh, one of our Christian cults uh, has told us that he's already returned in 1914. But it was invisible. He returned invisibly. We didn't see him. So he's already been here. Why am I mentioning that? You'll see. You, you may ask yourself some questions about why Paul's writing what he's writing, and this is part of the answer. 2,000 years later, the same thing is still happening. People are making things up. People are twisting the Scripture and making it say something they want it to say, usually to advance their own agenda, which usually involves benefiting from the reader's expense. So this is the coming his presence, his coming and subsequent presence with us and our gathering together unto him. Why the concern? Same as today. Needless fear about things that are not yet here. I don't know about you, but I've got people that as far as I know are not believers asking me, what do you think's going on? They know that I'm a minister. What's happening over in the Middle East? You know, it, 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 is there, are we in the middle of the end times? Is, is, you know, 
Is everything coming to a close? Which, what should I do to, you know, to be ready? And am I going to lose my, my, my job? Am I, is it going to be hard to get food? And blah, 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 blah. And on and on it goes. God doesn't want us to feel like that. Jesus doesn't want our hearts to be upset. He wants us to be in peace. And the scripture that we're reading tonight puts solid spiritual ground under our feet. That's why he wants it. We're urging you, brethren, through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, even our gathering together unto him. Why, Paul? For you. Everybody say you. Yeah. He repeats it. For you. You. Why would he do that? In contrast to everybody else that's biting their fingernails off up to the elbow. Paul says, I don't want you to live like these folks. I don't want you following these teachers that are scaring people. For you, you, in contrast to other people, not to be suddenly shaken. Shaken means something happens to us, right? We get the phone call, got the test results back. It's cancer. Boom. Something happens to us, right? We're shaken emotionally. That's the first thing. That's passive. Something happens to us, but it doesn't stop there. Look at it with me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 and following. Look at the next phrase. In your mind, nor to be troubling yourselves. So, first the shock, the doctor report. Then what I do with that shock. That's something that I get in. Oh, my gosh. Get redo your will and talk to Sister Hoop Nanny to pray for you and this and that. So two things are going on. He doesn't want us to be shaken with this bad news and then to take that news and be troubling ourselves on a daily basis. How would it happen? Neither through spirit. Did you know that evil spirits can teach? They can. They can inspire false teachers with false doctrine to take advantage of God's people. And it's still happening today. I, I read, I watch occasionally some Christian programs, not too much, but I do. And I, I have actually heard Christian people interviewed on Christian programs who have testified, well, a spirit spoke to me, an angel appeared to me and, and, and you know, told me about how to make sure that I go to heaven when I die. I heard another person say, you know what? I had a near-death experience, and I went not only to heaven, but I went to hell, and I saw some pastors down there and some good Christian people, and I thought, what in the world are you doing here? And the Lord said, unforgiveness. Yeah, they were my children, all right. I'm not talking about make-believers or sinners. Saved people. Yeah, they were my people, all right, but, you know, they, went, they, they, they left this life with with unforgiveness towards someone, so that, that's where they are. Go back and tell your Christian friend. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. That's the best thing I've heard since never. It's still happening. That wasn't an angel, and that's not God talking to whoever that Christian was that saw Christian people in hell. There won't be any uh, Christian people in hell, only unbelievers. This is deep, isn't it? Do you see what I'm saying? This is still happening 2,000 years later. Don't be troubled whether a spirit tells it to you or through a teaching, logos, somebody preaching or teaching something, or through an epistle, a letter, as though it's from me. As if through us that the day of the Lord or the day of Christ has come and remains. And I could stop there and preach for quite a while. I have had people for years, and I'm almost half a century in the ministry, telling other people things I've never said and attributing them to me. I've had people in nearly every church I've pastored come at one time or another up to the front of the room, and they'll say, among other things, you know, pastor, just like you preach, and they'll tell me something I've never preached in my entire life. They've got me mixed up with some other preacher. There's nothing wrong with that, but I don't feel comfortable with that. Do you like to be misrepresented? No one does, and especially if, if it's something that's really, really negative. But it happens. It, happened. it was happening to Paul. No doubt there were some false teachers telling some of these Christians, well, you don't believe this way? But Paul preaches it. Pavlos, he birthed this church. He, he says you guys are okay? Of course. And what if they don't investigate? 
Wow. Actions have consequences, right? So you see the, par- the problem here. The grammar is very helpful. First, the shock. And by the way, that shaking describes an earthquake or some kind of an upheaval. You're, you're hearing this bad news about being in the end of the age and the coming of the Lord. And so we're going to see you missed it. The second word, troubling yourselves, means just that, to be frightened and then to lament or to cry out, oh, woe is me. What happened? Uh, The Lord already returned and we're still here. That's not a good thing, is it? No. No. Just like today, false information, misinformation comes in many ways. There's another large uh, quasi-Christian cult that have really got this down to a science. They're at the place now, see, where every once in a while they get new revelations, and then they have to change their books a little bit. And it's the funniest thing. When their organization is criticized along any line, it's the most amazing thing. The leader gets a, a revelation to reverse that teaching. It's the, and suddenly nobody's angry at them anymore. Isn't that convenient? So, so anytime there's any kind of difficulty, uh, the prophet gets just a new vision, a new revelation. Oh, that explains that. Thank goodness. You know, well, we're okay. See, there's a lot to this. There are no new sins, just new sinners. Isn't this sad, beloved? False information. False information that's put forth as true. Uh, Again, these come through evil spirits, they come through teaching, they come through writing, they come through impersonating other people, putting words in a a man or woman of God's mouth that they never spoke, like they're doing here about Paul. Well, Paul said this was right. Well, if he said it, it must be good. Not necessarily. Everything that glitters ain't gold. How many with me? Yes. So, let's move on to this question now. Are we, then... Or are we not in the end of the age? Let me suggest that according to the Apostle Paul, which we've just read, two things have to happen. Two things have to happen before the Lord comes and we are gathered together unto him. What is Paul's subject matter in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1? Can I say it again? Now we are urging you, brethren, through the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, even our gathering together unto him, for you, you, in contrast to others who are being deceived, not to be suddenly shaken in your mind or to be troubling yourselves, neither through spirit nor through teaching nor through epistle or letter, as if through us, that the day of Christ has arrived and remains present. Now again, You and I might look at this and and think, well, how stupid is that? How could anybody believe that Jesus had returned and his people had been gathered together to him when we're all still here? That can't be what Paul's talking about. It's exactly what he's talking about, and it's still happening. As I said, one of our major quasi-Christian cults says the Lord returned in 1914. It already happened, but he was invisible and nobody saw it. That's today. That's not in the time of Paul. So you better believe it was happening back then. Sad, isn't it? Here it is. Let not anyone deceive you. Not in any way. Because it, what's it, Pastor? What he's talking about. The return of Christ and his presence with us and our gathering together unto him. Let not anyone deceive you, not in any way, because it shall not have come without the apostasy first. And the man of the sin, the one of the destruction, shall have been revealed. Are we all on the same page so far? If you have questions, please just jot it down. I think this is crystal clear. I think Paul is crystal clear. Two key events that precede the return of the Lord and are gathering together unto him. The first is the apostasy. The second, the revealing of whom Paul refers to as the man of sin, the man of destruction. Now, what, what is that apostasy, I wonder? You know, in general, we know what it means to believe a false doctrine, to depart from the faith. It comes from apo, which means from and stasis, to stand. So here we have the true gospel 
of Jesus Christ, promised in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, and someone, anyone, decides, yeah, I see all that, I don't want it. Right? They stand back from it. They, they used to be involved with people that believed the Old Covenant and New Covenant, the promise of Christ, the coming of Christ, the promise of salvation, the completion of salvation. They, they, they used to be right there, and they choose to step back. That's apostasy, to stand away. Let me ask you a question. Has that happened? Let me just add one more word here that's very important. It's the apostasy. So it's not just a general habit of some people leaving the faith, the true faith, standing away from it, but it's a particular one. And just today, when I was praying about this teaching tonight, I think the Lord gave me a little more insight. You and I, I think, if we're honest, know people have been leaving the true faith for centuries. I mentioned in my book, Ready for the Rapture, one large Bible-believing denomination finally put out a letter, Jesus Christ is not God. When asked about it, they said, our higher-ups have believed it for years. We felt like it was time to let the people know what we really believed. Yeah. So we know there's always been apostasy. People, uh, make-believers, standing off from the one true faith and going after some other new strange doctrine. But just today, as I say, as I was praying about this, I think the Lord gave me a little more insight. Because of the, of the definite article, the apostasy, it's a particular kind. When a, when a Greek writer uses an article, the, it's like a finger pointing. It, it, they, they don't do it just to put the, the, the article in there. It's, it's like a, it identifies and so it's almost as though Paul's pointing to a particular time and to a particular experience of people standing away, standing back from the one true faith. When would that be? I personally believe it's, in, it's, it's very likely that it's exactly what he's talking about next, the man of sin being revealed. How many of you know in the book of the Revelation, it talks about a whole mass of people taking the mark of the false Christ and worshiping him. Worship the beast, right? Worship his image. What religion do you think some of those people were before they did that? Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Professors, probably not necessarily Hindus, Buddhists, uh, Mohammedans, and so on, uh, uh, Muslims. Pro could be, but probably not so much that. But Because the apostasy means you're standing back from the one true faith in the, in the mind of Paul. He's talking about Christians. So yeah, I think it's entirely possible that these two signs are kind of linked together. A particular kind of apostasy. Yes, we've seen it for 2,000 years here and there. But there's going to be a particular one at the very last of the last days. And that's what we're asking. Are we in the end of the age? Uh, and again, bear in mind, back in Bible days, Paul told the Corinthians, what's wrong with you folks, I'm paraphrasing, those among you saying there's no bodily resurrection? How many have read that? If there's no bodily resurrection, then Christ wasn't raised, he says. If Christ isn't raised, we're still in our sin. So 2,000 years ago, there were some false teachers saying that there's no resurrection of the body. Others, according to Paul, writing to Timothy, were teaching, yeah, there's a resurrection, but it already happened. <laughs> well, where are these empty graves? Isn't this quite amazing? It, it, this was happening 2,000 years ago, things that don't make any sense. There's no bodily res resurrection. Another group saying, oh, yeah, there is, but it's already happened. What? Why couldn't and wouldn't some in the end of the age Start saying things like, oh, the return of the Lord. Yeah, it, but it already happened. Oh, who would do that for the fifth time, seventh time, tenth time? One whole quasi-Christian cult has said that. So I'm saying it's happened. There's no reason it couldn't happen again. 
Now, when it talks, talks about this second, the second item pre, be, before the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him, the man of destruction, it means he's destined for apolia. He's destined for eternal destruction. We read in the book of the Revelation that he's cast into the lake of fire, for example. Uh, what's, what about the other word? He's called the man of sin. Amartya, see, the, the man of, and it's, uh, there's an article, the man of the sin or the man of lawlessness. And for me, I read that, I see that article, the sin, the lawlessness, whichever text you want to read. I say to myself, ah, particular one, obviously, unbelief toward the true Christ. And Andi Christos is somebody that is a substitute for the true Christ. Is this helping anybody or just a great big bore? I hope not. Anybody see any of this happening? That's the question. Are we in the, the, the end of the ages? Anybody see any of this happening yet that we're talking about? I don't. I see some bad news in the Middle East. Absolutely. Some people suffering horrendously. Yes. One people group against another. It's horrific. Yes. But are we seeing any of this now? No. We're not. Are we in the end of the age? According to Paul, no. Why? Because... There hasn't been this particular falling away from the faith. And number two, this man of sin, this man of lawlessness, this one destined for destruction has not shown up yet. Can you tell me a little bit more about him, Paul? Sure. The one continually exalting him abo himself above each and everything being called divine or an object of worship. Watch this. So as for him to sit down in the Holy of Holies, the one of God, setting himself forth that he is divine. Is anyone doing that that you're aware of? Any even remote possibility that that might be happening? Is there any temple in Jerusalem for anyone to sit in at this juncture? Aren't you glad we don't have to be shaken? And we don't have to be troubling ourselves about what's going on. Because according to Paul, we're not in the end of the age yet. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15, and Mark 13, verse 14, something was going to happen just prior to his return. In addition to the gospel being preached in all the world as a witness, and his people, some of them being persecuted, and others doing great signs, wonders, and miracles besides all of that, he said, toward the end, there will be something that Jesus referred to as the abomination of desolation. Standing where it ought not to. Abomination translates a word that means something that stinks. Something that reeks. Something that is detestable or abominable. And when, he, when Jesus uses the word for destruction, it means just that. Desolation, destruction. So th something is going to happen. And uh, what most Bible scholars believe, and I'm, I'm inclined to agree, not that I'm a Bible scholar, but I'm inclined to agree with those who are, that we have a precursor of this. About less than 200 years before Jesus came, there was a Greek leader on the... On the uh, I'm trying to think of how I, how, I, how I would pronounce that. We would call him Antiochus in English, um, Andihios. He went into the temple and actually slaughtered a pig on the altar and dedicated it to the, the Greek pantheon of gods. This guy was such a loose cannon. I just read this recently. That he was called Andihos. Andi uh, Phaneris, I think it was, or Phaneris, meaning the bright one, the shining one, and they called him, they, they, it was a play on words, and they called him the mad one, the mad one instead of the shining one, because he was just off the chart. And then, of course, you know, it, it, when the Romans came in AD 70, sacked Jerusalem, they went into the temple, destroyed it, and they put the Roman standard in the Holy of Holies. So those are like, kind of like, uh, what would you call them? 
pre-shadowing a, a, a trailer for the, for the main event. And this is apparently what the one we know as the Antichrist is going to do. And so Paul finishes up here by saying, for the mystery of the lawlessness is already working. Now, this is one of the most important, um, important things we're going to look at tonight. We're coming in for a close here. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already working, only the one, Antichrist, restraining at present will until out of the midst he becomes. The picture is the sea of humanity we read about in the book of Revelation. And out of that sea of humanity arises this particular person, out of the midst, measure, right out of the middle, he he becomes. And that's the Antichrist. Watch this. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy by means of the shining of his coming. Now, let me just put it in reverse and let me give you the point here that we we need to really stress. When he finishes talking about who the Antichrist is, what he's going to do, sit down in the Holy of Holies, setting himself forth that he is divine. Listen to, listen to Paul pleading again now with this congregation. Are you not remembering that yet being with you, I was saying these things to you? What things, Paul? The things concerning the coming and subsequent present of, presence of our Lord and our being gathered together unto him. That will not happen unless two things happen. First, a particular falling away from the true faith. And secondly, the man of sin, the, the one of destruction, shall have been revealed. Now, here's the punchline. This is why I'm teaching this tonight. Are you not remembering that? Paul said, yet being with you, I was saying these things to you. In other words, why are you listening to someone else telling you that you're in the end of the age or the Lord already returned and you missed it or the resurrection isn't real or the resurrection took place and your in-laws and outlaws were left out? Why are you being taken captive by these false teachers and teachings? Here's the punchline. After he said all of this, and now you stand knowledgeable of the thing that is restraining. And here's where people get confused. Now you stand knowledgeable of the thing restraining with a view to him to be revealed in his own season. Most people, I'd say 99 out of 100 Bible commentators, see his and him referring to Antichrist being revealed. But that's not what Paul's been talking about. The he and the his, the he and the him, I should say, are referring to Jesus. And now you stand knowledgeable of the thing restraining with a view to him, Jesus, being revealed in his own season. How many are tracking with me? I was reading a commentary today that quoted Augustine about this same portion of Scripture, saying Augustine had basically said, I think it might be this, I think it might be that, but only God knows. None of us really know what Paul's talking about here. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like that kind of reasoning. I said to myself, it can't be this way. It's got to be in the actual text, and it is. If you just read it in context without inserting something that someone else has taught you or something that someone else wants us to believe, if you just read the text, it makes perfect sense. Paul has built his case line upon line, precept upon precept, finishes it and said, don't you remember what I'm telling you now? I already told you when I was with you, and now you know again what is preventing the coming of the Lord and his subsequent presence with us, as well as our gathering together unto him. It's this sinful antichrist being revealed. And then after this, 
Then shall the lawless one be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and will destroy by means of the epiphania, the shining forth of his parousia. Isn't that beautiful news? So I don't know about you, but I see no reason to tremble or, or, or to sit in a corner or to cover our head in the bed and, and uh, boo-hoo and say, you know, oh, woe is me. We're in the end of the age and it's over when we're not. And it's not. And how much time do we have? Only God knows. But what we do have are sure and certain signposts on the road to the Lord's return that ought to encourage us. Uh, it's not going to just happen. I was raised again in, in, in the belief that the master can return at any time. And uh, I, you know, I remember when I was in school, they were saying it was going to happen at a certain season of the year. And, and I went to sleep thinking, gee, I wonder, is it going to hurt when I get my new body? You know? and, and the Bible simply does not teach that. The Bible gives us the, the, the clear truth right here. It's a kind of a step by step by step by step deal. And we have this information so that we don't have to be swept up in some false teaching or false teacher. We don't have to be uh, caught off guard and led to believe something that's going to not only shake us, but cause us to be troubling ourselves over what we see and what we hear. So I believe that this is good news for God's people because uh, when the Lord does return, it's, it's good news. We're going to meet him in the air as he returns as king. We're going to rule and reign with him on planet Earth. We're going to receive rewards for every temptation we resisted and everything he asked us to do that we followed through on, and it's going to be a, a glorious time. Any questions, input, output? Any questions at all about what we've said tonight? Does it make sense? Has it helped anybody? Yes, brother. The harbor. Yeah. Nobody knew what was going on when they went in and shut the door in the harbor. You know? Right. I don't think we're ever going to know anything except it happens. You know? Yeah, right. We might be pulled closer because it's been longer. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and it could be tonight, or it could be in 20 years, or it could be in 100 years. I don't know. But you know, one thing that gets me is the prophecy that's coming through with Israel, yeah. with Russia, uh, Gog and Magog, and all that, yeah. looks looks pretty uh, outstanding. Yeah. You know, like it could. You know what I'm saying? Again, yeah. So if, if there's a temple. If, some, if someone starts building it. there, and those kinds of things would bring it more and more uh, cl closer and closer to fruition. <laughs> Can't come tonight because that's true too. The falling away toward the Antichrist hasn't happened yet, and the Antichrist hasn't been revealed. That's as simple as anybody can make it, in, unless and until those things happen. Do you? <laughs> Our hay man says when he's out bailing hay, he feels Satan's hot breath on his neck. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, verse 3. Yeah. Uh, the King James says, for that day shall not come. Yeah. And it's all in italics. Mm -hmm. And yet you seem to be giving Greek words in there that aren't in my text. Let anyone deceive you. In, not in any way, because it shall not have. It's aeon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They change. Uh, why a lot of that is, I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to fill in a few words, but because of the word aeon, which is if or it shall not have come unless the apostrophe comes first. The apostasy, <laughs> apostrophe, apostasy comes first and the man of the sin shall have been revealed. So the, the thrust of the King James is right, that day shall not come, that's what he, but the, again, what day are we talking about? The day of Christ's return. Uh, and that's what people seem to not get, and I don't understand why, because it's very, 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 very clear. Um, it's interesting to me also, and Solomon and I were talking about this, um, 
at the very close here when we were talking about the one uh, restraining, the one restraining, uh, it's called, uh, he, oh, he's called a mystery, neuter. Antichrist is called a mystery rather than he, he's called it. And we read about the image of the beast. How many have seen that? The image of the beast, that would be it. And then he's also called with a masculine pronoun, he. So it's very interesting. Both are used here of the Antichrist, and we see that same language in the Revelation. He's called uh, the, the, the uh, beast, you know, and the, the image of the beast. So it's, it's, to me, it's quite fascinating, but Scripture interprets Scripture, and Paul and John belong to the same denomination, so they don't work crosswise of each other. But, yeah, thanks for bringing that out. Um, I don't see anything to worry about, but a lot to be grateful for, personally. How about that? He doesn't know the day or the hour. That's what he said. Um, and then again, for our prophecy buffs, Jesus said to the disciples, it's not for you to know the time. That's where we get the word chronography, chronos. It's not for you to know the time or the season of his return. And yet people continue to write books about it. The, 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 the one who's coming himself said, it's not for us to know the literal time, what day or hour, or even the general season. Well, well, what do we do instead? But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses. In other words, our job is not to figure out the, the minutia of his return. Our job is to get the gospel out. And that's what he's concerned about. Yeah. Uh, so I have another question. Sure. Phrase the end of the age and the phrase the day of the Lord. Or is that the same thing? No. Because John see, seems to say, you know, that we're in the end times. Right. 2,000 years we're, ago. We, we're in the end of the age. Yeah, right. But obviously it isn't the day of the Lord. No. That's a very good point. The phrase day of the Lord is used two different ways. Paul uses the phrase day of the Lord of Jesus in 1 Thessalonians 5.2. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. He also refers to the day of the Lord Jesus twice in other letters. So, yeah, as in the return of Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus. Yes, but there's another, another phrase, day of the Lord, in the Old Covenant that had to do with judgment on unbelieving Israel. This is another thing that people confuse with New Testament prophecy. The day of the Lord of the Old Covenant was a time of judgment on disobedient, disbelieving Israel. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ, with the church, or the coming of Jesus. So, uh, again, if you mix things up or you try to put, you know, a square block in a round hole, it doesn't work. And so... I think God wants to eliminate that kind of confusion. That's one reason I felt like I wanted to remind us of these things tonight. Again, if you have time and you want to take the time, just download my book. It's a free download and just look at it very carefully, slowly. And you see it's very kind of simple what Paul laid out. And he taught the same thing in every church. And um, we just need to be busy about the master's business. And, uh, you know, are we closer to the... The, the end of the age than we were, of course, of course. Uh, how close? Again, um, the, the main thing is these two pointers that have to happen first. Anybody else? We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're giving tonight, that's super. It's some baskets here, one in the hallway. I still have a couple little copies of my book, The Horse of a Different Color. We saw a couple typos in there. It's already corrected those, so if you're ordering them online from Amazon or whatever, it's the, it's the corrected ones you would be getting for yourself or someone else.